Okay, thank you, Kathleen. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. And if you give me just a few minutes, got to make sure that my presentation comes up here. Thank you. So I hope this finds everyone well this morning and uh, in these very different times, I guess I would say. And uh, I'm gonna spend uh, the next 40 to 45 minutes covering this, this idea of soil testing and understanding and interpreting those results, hopefully in a manner that makes it a little bit more accessible. And I think what I find is people are all over the spectrum on, you know, being able to utilize the soil test reports effectively, whether they're using it for themselves or, you know, trying to help our clientele. And Kathleen asked me to do this, oh gosh, several months ago, long before the COVID-19 situation. But I think it's particularly timely uh, because my observation and some of the other extension agents that I've spoken with, we're really seeing an uptick in citizens wanting to grow their own food or at least grow some food. And for some of them, they haven't done it for a long, long time. And so we, we have been fielding a lot of calls about soil testing and a lot of these folks have never seen one of these reports before. So I think it's really timely that we kind of review this this topic for some of you it may be it, it may be a real review because you have a, a firm grip for for others maybe not so much and and hopefully everybody will, will come away with some usable information from this conversation so uh, as far as the the topics i'd like to cover today i, I do want to spend just a couple of minutes with a with a simple overview of the soil testing process but really spend the bulk of the time on, you know, breaking down these reports. If, if you are trying to help somebody that has never seen one of these reports before, it can be a bit overwhelming just to the sheer num uh, number of uh, data points and things like that. So I wanna try to break it down and make it a little bit more digestible. And, and finally is making recommendations based on those results. Now, it's one thing to see the recommendations. Uh, it's another thing to be able to translate those recommendations to a particular situation. So hopefully, you know, we're gonna accomplish those things. So what I'll say is just, you know, the, the, the functions of the soil test as I see it is, uh, is multifaceted. One is to determine the nutrient status of the soil, clearly, uh, and, and also to determine the soil pH. But I'd like to go a little bit further than that. Uh, and, and for uh, those that are willing to spend a little extra money because these soil tests do cost money, you can pay a little, a little extra and, and have the lab analyze for organic matter. And I think that that is particularly valuable, especially uh, for those of us that are doing vegetable gardening, uh, simply because to, to it, increase the organic matter content in soil substantially. It can be a fairly labor intensive process, time intensive and cost. It's one thing to increase organic matter in a you know, 20 by 40 garden bed or something like that. It's a completely different animal if we're talking about trying to do this on an 11,000 square foot lawn. Having said that, organic matter is, is in my humble view, probably one of the most important things that we ought to be paying attention to as we try to manage our soil. Because as I've, as I've heard long ago, and I think it makes real sense, is if you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants. And if you're interested in reducing inputs, reducing the need for you know, pesticides, the healthier soil you have, the healthier plants you're gonna have, they're gonna be able to withstand 
climatic challenges, pest challenges, the whole nine yards. And then of course, when we get down to the recommendation part of the soil test, it's gonna help us determine the proper type and amount of fertilizer and lime that we need. And this is important from an environmental standpoint because we certainly don't want to be applying extra nutrients that then have a tendency to go somewhere we don't want them to go, whether it be groundwater or into the atmosphere. And then also the economic input perspective. So, you know, these things are not free. Lime is not free, fertilizer is not free. So why put it out if we don't need to? Uh, and, and this is what I find is most interesting because it seems like there, there are a lot of folks around that just are, are positively convinced that in Virginia, you need to lime your soil every year because it's full of acid. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. But if you don't test, you're guessing. So, and then finally, it is a monitoring tool. And there are uh, folks that I have worked with in the farm community, but also master gardeners and residential people that are really into this concept of managing their soil. And they use the soil test on a frequent basis to, to see are they making progress? You know, they've got a starting point, they've got this end point in mind, this place they want to get to, uh, and they use that soil test as a monitoring tool and do it repeatedly over a number of years. So I often get the question, you know, how often do I need to do this? When should I do it? And, and my answer is it depends. That is a classic extension answer to a lot of questions. I would say every two to three years is, is fine. You know, if you are really into it and want to do it yearly, that's great too. But I don't think it's necessary for the, for the average situation. Uh, another question we get a lot is when should we sample? Well, I would say you sample when you can. If there's an ideal time, maybe it's the fall. And that is primarily because if we find that our soil is acid and does need limestone to correct that issue, Limestone uh, takes several months to react in the soil and do its thing. So if you can sample in the fall, discover that you need lime with, with an adequate amount of time to get that application down in the fall, it's got all winter to work. And then when the growing season comes next spring, we're ready to go. But I, I think probably if you're using this as a monitoring tool, what's more important is that you sample the same time each time. And that is because there's seasonal variation. You know, from spring to fall, from summer to winter, et cetera. So if you start your sampling process in the spring, I would say kind of stick on the spring schedule. If you do it in the fall, stay on the fall schedule. So same time each time. As far as uh, sampling equipment, you know, there's probes out there that you can buy specifically for soil testing. Every extension office ought to have one, if not more than one and uh, these should be available to you tomorrow. Now, I would say for the average homeowner, it's not worth the money to own your own because they're not cheap. And the fact of the matter is a garden trowel or a shovel works just fine. A soil probe is a little bit easier to work with perhaps, but don't let the perfect get in the way of the good, a garden trowel is A-OK. -okay. Uh, as far as the container you wanna put your sampling, uh, use for sampling, just you know, stick with clean plastic buckets. You know, there is some risk perhaps if you were to use a metal container or a bucket that you could get a little contamination from, from the galvanized coating or something like that. But probably not a big risk, but hey, you can get a five gallon pail at Lowe's for a couple of bucks or some other big box store. And then if you've never done it before, there is an information sheet in a sample box that we, we need for you to use so that we're consistent in what we send to the lab. So as far as, as obtaining these samples, again, a soil probe works best, but you can use a shovel or a spade or a trowel. As far as how deep should we sample, that's a pretty common question. The rule of thumb is that if it's a permanent sod, like a lawn, the top two, three inches is sufficient. That's where most of the, the biological activity and root activity is happening. If we're in a tilling situation, like in our garden, you know, just go as deep as your garden tiller goes. Maybe that's six inches, maybe it's eight. You know, just kind of use that as your guide. What you want to do is get several, what we call subsamples from the area in question and mix those together and fill your box and complete the form. 
you know, we would say in an ideal world, have that sample be 100% soil, no roots, no rocks, no litter. Out here in the real world, if you, especially if you're using a larger tool like a spade, there's gonna be some root pieces in there. You know, there's maybe gonna be a pebble once in a while, and that's okay. Just try to have it be as close to 100% soil that you put in that box as possible. And then, and that is because the reliability of the soil test is only going to be as good as the sample that you submit. So we talk about getting a lot of subsamples or at least a number from a, an area in question. And that's because soils do, they, they vary. They vary even across a typical yard situation. So to go out in the middle of your, of your garden or to go out in the middle of your lawn, take one scoop of soil, throw it in the box and send it to the lab is not what we call representative. So you want to get, you know, several, I don't know, four, six, eight subsamples, mix those together. You know, just try to, to be random, go in a zigzag fashion. And I believe this next slide may kind of illustrate that. So yeah, you know, it, it doesn't have to be any particular pattern that you use, just try to cover the areas in question. You know, we also get a, get a question very frequently, you know, hey Scott, I've got a front lawn, I've got a back lawn, I've got flower beds, I've got vegetable gardens. You know, do I need to submit samples from every one of those areas? And my answer is, it depends. So, and the reason I say that is because it really just does depend on how specific you want to be, okay? But keep in mind, every one of these samples costs money. So in the real world, what my advice is, is that if you've got a lawn and you've got a vegetable garden, those are two logical separations I would make. Get a representative sample from the vegetable garden, get a representative sample from the lawn, send those two in. You know, if you also have flower beds and trees and shrubs, you know, you can, you can sample those independently if you'd like and spend the extra money, uh, or you can probably make some estimations based on the lawn sample. Now, one caveat to that is if you do have acid loving plants, let's say you've got a bed of azaleas or a, a, a set of blueberry plants, you know, they need to be managed very differently. So I would definitely have those be a separate set of samples. Okay, it, obviously it's important to fill out the, uh, the form properly. And that is because you know, the, the lab's only going to have the information that you give them. So just a few things that, that are on this form that, that I want to make sure I cover. One is the sample identification. This is in this red box right here. This becomes particularly important if you've got uh, more than one sample you are submitting so you can keep it straight. You know, it might be a couple weeks before you get the results back, and it might be a couple weeks after that before you really sit down and study them. You know, are you going to remember that sample one was the front lawn and sample two was the garden? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. At least write it down, but, but come up with a system that makes sense for you. You also want to make sure that you tell the lab what plants you want to grow. And you have these options over here. Now, many times people will ask me, they'd say, well, I, I want a recommendation for a lawn and for a garden and for my apple orchard from this one sample. Well, the lab only gives you one code to work with. So pick one and that's the one you'll get a recommendation for. That's okay if you want recommendations for additional crops because we can take that information, the actual results that, this, that the soil lab finds and we can extrapolate from that, okay? So just pick one and go with it. And then the only soil information that the lab asks for is the last lime application. That becomes important if you have done any liming within the last oh, year, year and a half or so, because limestone is slow to be released and react with the soil. And because of that, if you did an application of lime, let's say two months ago, then the, the lab is going to allow a credit for that additional liming value that is going to be released into the soil as they make their lime recommendation. So that's an important piece of information for an accurate recommendation if you know that information. And then down here in the, in the blue box is where the, the soil test desired and fee schedule is. 
you know, routine analysis is probably what most people get. That's going to give you the basics, the soil pH, the macronutrients, micros, and, and then a set of recommendations. Uh, I'd submit to you, especially in a, in a vegetable gardening situation uh, or, or a situation where you're going to be trying to grow anything food-wise and you really want to have healthy soil, I would opt and say it's worthwhile to spend four bucks and, and get the organic matter content in. And then the other test that they offer there is one called soluble salts. In a normal residential situation, soluble salts is probably rarely needed. That is an assessment of whether or not there are excessive levels of, of fertilizer salts in the soil. Uh, I rarely see that except in container situations, you know, house plants, or if you're in a greenhouse situation. So again, it, it's not much money. It's only an additional $2. So I'll leave that up to you. But I would say as you're advising clients, you know, unless they are following that category of container gardening or, or, or nursery and landscape or uh, greenhouse situations, you know, they, they, don't, they don't need that. If you have not visited the Soil Testing Laboratory's website, uh, I would encourage you to do so. There's a wealth of information there. You know, the one document that is particularly useful is the soil test note number one. That's the explanation of soil tests. That'll walk you through this report and, and can answer a lot of the questions up front. Because remember, you know, if somebody's new to looking at these reports, they can be a bit overwhelming with all the numbers. And I think this explanation document does a really good job of, of, of trying to break it down. And speaking of breaking it down, let's move on into looking at what a soil test report is, how it's built, and, and where to start looking and training your eyes for certain information. So where I would say, where I would start is with the idea and understanding all of these reports are built the same way, okay? They have a sample history, which is listed right here at the top of the report. That just is where the sample ID is and some other information that is really not relevant to the homeowner samples. The lab uses the same report template for residential situations as they do for commercial agriculture. So the submittal form for commercial ag uh, requests a lot more information as it results to cropping history and more specific soil information that the residential sample does not ask for. But, so, those are going to be on your report as well, and they're going to be blank. Now, you may have something here in the last line application if you filled that particular block out on your form. Then we have the results section, which is where the lab is going to report on the actual levels of nutrients that they found in your soil. And then at the bottom of every report is where we move into the recommendations. So they're going to list the crop that you asked a recommendation for, then they are going to list out lime recommendation if one is needed, fertilizer recommendation, and then depending on what other, what other tests you wanted to have run, you might see something as it relates to soluble salts or something like that, okay? So they're all built the same way. So moving into a discussion of the results section, basically this first line of boxes is where the lab is gonna present the macronutrients, which I've got highlighted in red, the micronutrients highlighted in blue, and the soluble salts, which is the green box, if that test has been, has been run, okay? So the macronutrients, and you remember your master gardener training, macronutrients are simply the essential plant nutrients that are needed in higher quantities. They're not necessarily any more important than micronutrients. It's just the plants need more of them in a, from a quantity standpoint. So the, the macros that the lab analyzes for is phosphorus, which is indicated by P, potassium indicated by K, calcium indicated by CA, and magnesium indicated by MG. Okay? Now, the lab takes the results that they find, and they then make an estimate of the relative pounds of that nutrient per acre. 
Well, for us in the residential setting, that really doesn't mean a lot, okay? And the fact of the matter is I don't get too worried about looking at the raw numbers. They can be useful in a situation where you're trying to diagnose an issue or you're worried about you know, excessive amounts, okay? But for most of us, what's, what's easier to work with is the rating system. So the rating system, as I imagine you have already determined, is a pretty straightforward letter system, L equals low, M equals medium, H equals high, and VH equals very high. And within that, you may see a plus or minus, which simply means it's at the high end of that letter or the low end. So if it's high minus, it's barely into the high range. If it's high plus, it's almost into the very high range. So what I like about the rating system the lab uses is very quickly, you can do an assessment of where you stand with each one of those nutrients and not get worried about all these numbers and what do they mean and making your eyes go cross, okay? So focus on the, on the rating. Moving into the micronutrients, the lab analyzes for zinc, manganese, copper, iron, boron, okay? And you will notice that they go to a different rating system. And that is because plants need micronutrients. They are essential, but plants need very little of them. And rarely do we run across situations in a residential setting where we are gonna be deficient in micronutrients. Occasionally we might see this, or with certain crops that people are growing that might have a higher requirement for a micronutrient, but the vast majority of the time, it's gonna be sufficient, and that's what they use. S-U-F-F -F for sufficient, or D-E-F for deficient, okay? So again, a quick glance, you just scan across that and you say, yep, we're good. If you have paid for the additional soluble salts test, you will see a report there. And it goes back to the rating system that we use for the macros. So again, uh, soluble salts were analyzed in this particular report and it was low, so no concern there. Moving to the second row of boxes for the results section, what I mostly am asking people to pay attention to here is the soil pH and the buffer index, okay? That is an assessment of the acidity of our soil, and that is what generates any lime recommendation that is made, okay? Now, soil pH is what most of us are familiar with work, working with. It is, a, it is a zero to 14 scale. It's an assessment of acidity. Most plants like to be in a neutral soil pH, a neutral amount of, of acidity in the soil. So that's gonna be somewhere between six and seven, okay? Notable exceptions, we have many acid-loving plants that wanna be more like four or five. You know, the lower the number, the more acidic the soil is. Now, the lab actually also generates a buffer index number, okay? And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that other than saying this buffer index is a more precise measure of total acidity in the soil, okay? And the buffer index is what the lab uses in their formulas to generate the, the, the Lyme recommendation, okay? So the buffer index starts at 6.6, .6, and as the soil becomes more acidic, it goes down from there, okay? But for all intents and purposes, working out here in the real world, pay attention to soil pH. And then on the other end of this line is organic matter. Again, an optional four fee test. So if you have paid for that, you will see a number here. And I would say that in general, uh, the soils in Virginia as well as the whole mid-Atlantic tend to be pretty low in organic matter naturally. And, you know, if we see soils in our lawns where we haven't actively managed to increase organic matter, it's probably going to be about 2 to 3%. So you can see here 7.9. This, this soil is very rich in organic matter, and therefore it's probably a pretty healthy soil. Okay, and then the final part of every report is the recommendation section. This is where you're going to tell them the crop you want. 
And then based on that crop and the levels of nutrients and the soil pH, they are gonna generate a lime recommendation and a fertilizer recommendation specific to that particular soil and what they found in it. So for instance, uh, the lime recommendation is listed first. And for this particular report, client has a vegetable garden, the lab took into account soil pH and buffer index, and that generated a recommendation of 10 pounds of agricultural limestone per 100 square feet. Okay. Now, agricultural limestone, ground or pulverized. In reality, most of us are going to use pelleted limestone in a residential setting because it's easier to handle. If you've ever tried to get ground or pulverized limestone to go through a spreader, like in a lawn, you lose your mind because it gets bridged up and it, if it gets wet, forget about it. But if you have pelleted limestone, it, it kind of flows very nicely like fertilizer does. And pelleted limestone is exactly the same as ground limestone. It's just been run through a pelletized machine to make it easier to handle. As soon as it's hit by water, rain, irrigation, it starts to disperse in the soil. And then the fertilizer recommendation is, is down here in the green box. And again, based on the nutrient levels in the soil and the fact that we want to grow a vegetable garden, the recommendation is listed as apply two pounds of 10, 10, 10 per 100 square feet. And then finally, since we did ask for a soluble salts test, they say right here, a final note, soluble salts are not high enough to cause injury. Okay, so that's how the general report is built. Whether it is a lawn sample, a garden sample, a farm sample, the report is going to be configured the same way. So you can start to draw your eyes to certain parts of this report, understand it quickly, and, and use the information effectively. So now that we know how the report is presented, how do we use that information to make recommendations? So some key points, in, in, in my opinion, is that uh, to understand, number one, lime recommendations are based on the soil pH and the buffer index, right? Fertilizer recommendations are based primarily on levels of phosphorus and potassium that the lab finds in your soil, okay? Nowhere on that form did you see nitrogen. That's because the lab does not analyze for nitrogen. And the reason for that is nitrogen is simply too volatile in the environment, okay? By the time you dug up the soil, put it in a box, sent it to the lab, you know, some portion of that nitrogen would have volatilized into the atmosphere. So it's just not an accurate test if they were to run one. Therefore, any recommendation for nitrogen is based on research. We know that if you want to grow a cool season grass lawn, you need this much nitrogen for a vegetable garden this much, for blueberries this much, okay? So that's how the nitrogen recommendation is presented. Some other key points that you really need to know up front. Lawn recommendations are provided on a 1,000 square feet increment, okay? So much lime per 1,000 square feet, so much fertilizer per 1,000 square feet. Vegetable gardens, on the other hand, as well as the tree, shrub, and flower tests that go in are provided on a 100 square feet increment, okay? So that's a big difference, factor of 10, right? So keep that in mind uh, when you are looking at these recommendations and helping citizens interpret them. One recommendation is based on 1,000 square feet, vegetable garden on 100 square feet. Now, as it relates to the lawn fertil the fertilizer recommendations specifically, for lawn tests, it's a bit more complicated than it is for vegetable gardens, okay? And that is because the way the lab presents a recommendation for lawn fertilizer samples is it's based on a standard of either using a generic ratio fertilizer or a generic quote unquote turf type. That either one of those the lab is going to recommend that type of fertilizer to supply a desired amount of actual nitrogen. Okay, as an example, you might see the recommendation apply one pound of actual nitrogen using a 2-1-1 ratio fertilizer, or you might see apply one pound of actual nitrogen using a turf type fertilizer. 
And the lab will make one of those two recommendations based on the phosphorus and potassium levels that they find in your soil, okay? No fertilizer is 100% pure, okay? So that's why you're gonna have to be able to do some math as you're helping people understand lawn fertilizer recommendations and translate in that into, okay, I need to go buy X number of pounds of this blend, okay? And we'll do some examples here in a minute, and hopefully we'll make that clear. Veggie garden recommendations for fertilizer are more straightforward. Basically, it's gonna be something on the order of use a specific amount of a fertilizer blend. Example, use two pounds of 10, 10, 10. Or if your soil already contains adequate phosphorus and potassium, it may, it may be a recommendation such like use half a pound of a nitrogen containing fertilizer such as calcium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, urea, et cetera. So those are tend to be a, honestly a lot more straightforward for, for people to comprehend. It's also important to, to hit this right now is all those recommendations are given on a standardized square footage. Veggie gardens per 100 square feet, lawns per thousand. I have yet to see a lawn that is exactly 1,000 square feet so that I could take that report in it and if it says use two pounds of something, well, hey, I've got a 1,000 square foot lawn so I can just go do two pounds, all right? Everybody's got different size lawns, vegetable gardens, et cetera. So you need to be able to translate what the lab is recommending to the actual on the ground situation. And further, you know, most areas are not a perfect square, rectangle, triangle, you know, this is in Kansas. Uh, most, most of our lawns, most of our gardens are irregular, okay? But don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. We do the best we can. You know, remember your, your, uh, your math class in uh, middle school or elementary school, how do we get square footage? You know, I'm gonna say generally use length times width. <laughs> Okay, and then use your best judgment on odd shaped areas. You know, I'm not very technologically savvy with all the apps and things out there. There's probably area determination apps you can get on your phone and you walk around your lawn and it calculates it for you. But hey, do the best you can. Now, the other thing is, all right, we need a, we need a what I would say, coordinated way to a process, if you will, to take the information the lab gives us and be able to figure out, translate and apply that to a situation in the real world. There's many ways to do that. I think that this four-step plan works pretty well. And you, know, you may find another way that works well for you. But, but I, I think that, that this, this can work pretty well. So it's just four steps. So the first step is you gotta determine the square footage for the area you want to apply amendments, and then how many increments of that standardized lab recommendation do you have, okay? Be it a 100 square foot increment or a 1,000 square foot increment. The second step is uh, I read the report for the recommendation of lime and or fertilizer. The third step is I calculate the amount of lime needed to apply to my area. And that recommendation will be X number of pounds per 100 square feet or per thousand square feet. And you multiply that by how many increments do you actually have in your lawn or in your garden. And then the final step is you do the same thing for fertilizer. Okay, so let's work through an example. Uh, this is a vegetable garden sample that came in and the lime recommendation is in blue. Uh, the fertilizer recommendation is green. Remember, these reports are built the same way, so the information is always put in the same place. So let's take a scenario here. We've got a garden area that's 20 by 40 feet. The soil test that I just showed you in the previous slide indicates that 10 pounds of lime is needed per 100 square feet. And the soil test results recommend that two pounds of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer is needed. Per 100 square feet. Okay, so the first step 
that I go through is, all right, well, how many square feet do I have? And how many increments of 100 square feet do I have? So some quick math, 20 feet by 40 feet equals 800 square feet. I take that 800 square feet and I divide it by that standardized increment of 100 that the lab gives me. And now I know that I've got eight increments. Okay, so this will work with any size area. If you are doing raised bed gardens and you've got a four by eight bed, well, you've got 32 square feet, okay? So in that scenario, your numerator, instead of 800 square feet, would be 32 square feet. And you would divide it by the 100 square feet, and you'd come up with actually 0 0.32 increments, right? Because 32 square feet is less than 100, and our recommendation is based on 100, okay? So I read the report for the recommendations of soil amendments, and remember, it said we needed 10 pounds of lime and two pounds of triple tin. So the third step is just to take that recommendation and multiply it by the number of increments that I have in my garden space. So the lab said you need 10 pounds for every 100 square feet. I've got eight increments. So simple math, 10 times eight. I need 80 pounds of lime. When I go to the store, that's what I need to buy, okay? And then finally, the fertilizer recommendation. Same process. What does the lab say I need? Two pounds of triple 10 per every 100 square feet. I've got eight increments of 100 square feet. Two times eight equals 16 total pounds. That's how many pounds of fertilizer I need to go buy and apply. Okay. So as I said, the vegetable garden one is just what I would say a little bit easier to deal with, specifically as it relates to fertilizer. Now, but we get lots of calls from clients that have analyzed their soil for, for lawn management, and we need to be able to help them. The worst thing that can happen is we convince somebody to take a soil test, they pay the money, they get the report, and the information is bewildering to them, or we are not able to present it to them in a way that they can absorb and digest, and they just throw their hands up and say, well, that was worth so we don't want to put ourselves in that position for sure. Again, lawn result report built the same way, lime recommendation, fertilizer recommendation at the bottom of the report, okay? So here's our lawn scenario. We've got 11,000 square feet. The soil test uh, indicates that we need 50 pounds of lime per 1,000 square feet, because remember the lawn recommendations are per 1,000 square feet. The soil test result recommends a 2-1-1 ratio, okay? That's not a particular brand or blend of fertilizer. And I'll work you through how you figure that out, how you translate that into the real world, okay? And the lab said, all right, we know that a good application of nitrogen for cool season grass is one pound of actual nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. Okay, so keep that in your mind as we move through this. So the first step is the same as it would be for, for anything else. We got to determine uh, our square footage, which I've already told you is 11,000 square feet, and we divide that by our increment standard, our 1,000 square feet. So 11,000 divided by 1,000, we've got 11 increments that we need to, to deal with. The Report, read the report for the recommendation of lime and fertilizer. So the soil test indicates that we need 50 pounds of lime per 1,000 square feet. It also recommends that we need to use a fertilizer that has a ratio of 2 one, one. And we want to use that fertilizer so that it applies one pound of actual nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. Okay, and I'm going to stop right there because I want to remind everybody, you know, fertilizer is graded and sold in a very standardized format. When you go to the store, you usually see fertilizer. It'll have three numbers. It'll have a, a number here in the first lot, a number here, and a number here. First number is always the percent nitrogen. Second number is always the percent phosphorus. Third number is always the percent potassium. Okay, so... The lab is saying you need to find a fertilizer that approximates this kind of ratio, which means 
you want a, you want a fertilizer blend that has twice as much nitrogen as it does phosphorus and potassium. They are not suggesting a particular brand or a particular fertilizer blend. They're just saying whatever you use, use one that has twice as much nitrogen as it does phosphorus and potassium. And then once you select that, you need to calculate the amount of that blend <clears throat> to provide one pound of actual nitrogen. And the reason for that is there's no such thing as pure nitrogen fertilizer. Okay, so if I use 10, 10, 10, that fertilizer is 10% nitrogen. If I use 20, 20, 20, that fertilizer is 20% nitrogen. Okay, so let's move and do the lime. That one's uh, pretty straightforward, just like the veggie garden one. It says that we need 50 pounds per thousand square feet. We've got 11 increments, so 50 times 11 increments equals 550 total pounds of lime will apply the correct amount on the entire lawn area. Now, the fertilizer that we need, the recommendation per thousand square feet multiplied by the number of increments, which in our example is 11, okay? As I've stated, fertilizer recommendations for lawns are a bit more complicated because the lab gives you either use a certain ratio or use a turf type to apply, to supply a certain amount of nitrogen. So what would be an example of, of how to figure this out if you're gonna choose the 2-1-1 ratio blend? Okay, remember 2-1-1 is simply just a blend that has twice as much nitrogen as it does phosphorus and potassium. So the, a simple formula can, you can use for that the lab says you should be applying one pound of nitrogen for 1,000 square feet using a 2-1-1 ratio fertilizer. So a fairly common blend that I have seen in the marketplace that is an example of a 2-1-1 ratio is a product that has 16% nitrogen, 8% phosphorus, 8% potassium, okay? So how do I figure out, if I wanna use this, how much I need to apply a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, okay? Well, little algebra, I think they call this algebra. We want our desired amount of nitrogen is one pound. So that's your numerator. The denominator is the percent nitrogen you got in the blend that you bought, okay? So in this case, it's 16. You multiply that by 100 and you get 6.25 pounds of that particular blend, that's 1688. 1,000 square feet will provide one pound of nitrogen, okay? The reason you need 6.25 pounds and not one pound is because this fertilizer is only 16% nitrogen, okay? Now, if the lab, in, as an example, said you don't need a 211 because you've got adequate phosphorus and potassium, you need a turf type, okay? So what's a turf type? Well, there's a bazillion of them out there. It's simply just a fertilizer blend that is rich in nitrogen, little or no phosphorus, and a little bit of potassium, okay? So you're gonna see a turf type fertilizer recommendation by the lab if they find adequate levels of phosphorus and potassium in your soil, okay? So, same formula. The lab wants you to apply one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. But now we're gonna use this turf type, which is a different blend. The numerator stays the same. That's our desired amount, one pound. We divide that by the percent nitrogen in the product that we have on hand. In this case, it's 25%. Multiply it by 100, we get four pounds, okay? The reason it's four pounds and not 6.25 in the previous example is because this product is more concentrated in nitrogen. Okay, it's 25% versus 16%. Therefore, you don't need as much to supply that standard one pound, okay? So let's uh, use the example from the lab. They said use a 2-1-1 ratio. I am telling you that you can find a product called 16-8-8 that approximates a 2-1-1 ratio. 
It's twice as much nitrogen as it is phosphorus and potassium. From the previous uh, little calculation that we did, we know that we need 6.25 pounds of that blend for 1,000 square feet to supply one pound of nitrogen. But we've got 11 increments of that 1,000 square feet. Okay, so how much fertilizer do we need to go buy? We take that 6.25, we multiply it by 11, and we end up with, you know, close to 70 pounds of actual fertilizer that we need to go to the store and buy. Now, the final question that we, that we often will get is what about using fertilizer types or blends that differ from, that differ from the examples used by the lab? and understanding that not all fertilizers are created equal, right? I just gave you those two examples. You had 1688 versus 2507. They're very different, have different concentrations of nutrients in them. How do we translate that? Well, uh, in, in, on top of that, people often want to use a fertilizer that differs from the examples provided by the lab. So the lab says for that veggie garden, you need X amount of 10, 10, 10. Well, what if you don't want to use 10, 10, 10? What if you want to use an organic source that's a different blend, that's a different level of nutrients? How do you make that calculation? Well, you can do it, trust me. You just need to be able to, to do a little bit more math, okay? So running through a quick example, if our soil test for the garden recommends three pounds of 10, 10, 10 per 100 square feet, but you are not interested in using 10, 10, 10, you want to use plant to an organic fertilizer. I suspect many of you have heard of that product. It's commercially available. Uh, and you may get clients that call and say, hey, I don't want to use 10, 10, 10. I want to use plant to All right. Well, we need to be able to, to tell them how to, how to make that translation, okay, so that we're dealing apples to apples. So, yeah, we got to do a little more math, but it's not as complicated as it might seem. Uh, generally, for me, the way to think about it is the most straightforward path is to determine the nutrient content of the fertilizer you want to use and then compare that to the lab recommendation. So in our example, the lab recommended 10, 10, 10. Okay, remember, fertilizer is graded in a standard format. The first position in the blend is always the percent nitrogen, second percent phosphorus, third percent potassium. Okay, so 10, 10, 10 has got 10% nitrogen. But we want to use plant tone. And if you look at the back of the bag, I think it says it's 533 or something close to that. So what does that mean? It's not the same as 10, 10, 10, all right? It only contains 5% nitrogen. Therefore, the recommendation for 10, 10, 10, keep in mind it has twice the nitrogen content. It's simply just what's in 10, 10, 10, 10%. What's in plant tone, 5%. So you take the product you're starting with, that's the numerator, the product you desire, that's the denominator. Division, you get two, you get a two multiplier. So if the lab is recommending three pounds of triple 10, you need twice that amount, okay? You can't just say, well, the lab said three pounds of 10, 10, 10, so they want to use plant tone, yeah, just use three pounds, okay? It doesn't work that way because we need to be supplying the same amount of fertilizing value regardless of the product that we choose. So with the plant tone, again, since it is less concentrated, we've done the math, we know it's, we know that you need twice as much. So three pounds of 10, 10, 10 times two, you need six pounds of plant tone. All right. I have thrown a lot of information in a short period of time, and you still may be scratching your head and saying, well, I, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, what I would say is this was just an overview. As Kathleen mentioned, uh, this presentation is gonna be uh, cataloged so you can go back and watch it. Hopefully the way I have presented it uh, breaks it down and makes it a little bit more digestible. At the end of the day, the soil testing is only valuable to us and our clients if we understand it and use the recommendations correctly. At first, it can seem a bit overwhelming. There's lots of numbers on these reports. Sometimes you need to, most of the time actually, you need to be able to translate those recommendations into a situation on the ground, okay? 
what I would say to you is as you begin to work with these, focus on key constituents. Lots of numbers on the page. Focus on phosphorus levels, potassium levels, soil pH. If you can get those down and understand them, great. If organic matter percent is analyzed for, and I would encourage you to do so, that's another one that I would really pay some attention to. All those other numbers are important. They have value. If you're really into this idea of, of soil analysis, we can talk about those in more detail, but understand those are the key ones. In my opinion, with practice, it will become easier. If all else fails, ask a veteran master gardener in your unit or your local extension agent. And finally, folks, don't guess, soil test, all right? So with that, uh, if time allows, uh, we uh, can try to answer some questions. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Kathleen. Great, thank you so much, Scott. We have gotten some questions in the chat box throughout your presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and start kind of our first ones and just work the way down for as much time as we have. Um, let's see, do you have a list of approved labs that test for any other elements that Virginia Tech does not cover, such as heavy metals or pesticides? I don't know if we have a complete list. I know of some additional labs that can provide that testing. And I see, you know, maybe between myself and other agents and or state master garden coordinators, we could come up with that. But those labs do exist, yes. Um, if you have a rating of very high in your macronutrients, do you need to do anything to adjust? What I would say with that is, uh, number one, it's important to know if your levels are very high because at that point, we do not expect additional plant growth response from fertilizer of that nutrient. So number one, from an economic standpoint and an environmental standpoint, we do not want to apply that nutrient if we find that it is already very high in the soil. Going beyond that, that can be useful to understand uh, what the relative number means. Like if they, find, if they say it's very high in phosphorus and they say that they found uh, 500 pounds of that nutrient on a per acre basis. We have got uh, guidance from the lab where, we, where that number becomes a concern. Where is it very high such that now it is potentially going to overwhelm the capacity of the soil to hold that nutrient and run the risk of you know, pollution either through groundwater or some other means. So that was a long way of saying maybe if you see it's very high, uh, that might be worth taking a look at that number, talking to your agent, asking them to get the numbers from the lab so that we know is that high enough to be a concern from an environmental standpoint. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, if a client wants to use a fast-acting lime, how do you adjust the quantities um, since she assumes the soil report is for regular lime, not the fast-acting? Two parts there is the, the lab recommendation is, is based on um, typical agricultural lime that has a liming value. I think they use what we call calcium carbonate equivalent that's set at 100. And uh, every lime that is sold in the Commonwealth of Virginia as a liming material must, must tell you what its CCE or liming value is. So if you were to buy a product that had a CCE or liming value that was above 100, that would indicate that it had higher liming value and you could make the, the approximate adjustment. So if you bought if you, if you bought a product that was 125 CCE, you, you could conceivably lower the lab's recommendation by approximately 25%. But do be careful when you see things like fast acting lime or super lime or things of that nature, okay? Because uh, it, it's buyer beware. Some of the products may be fast acting simply because they have been ground finer or they have put in a, been put in a liquefied format. So they react quicker with the soil. It may not be that they necessarily have any ultimately higher liming value. They just go to work faster. So that's one where you might wanna do a little research before you make that final recommendation. 
right. The next question is, could you go through the buffer index explanation again? Yeah, I was afraid somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, as I understand it, you know, the, the, the buffer index is, is a measurement that the lab makes that quantifies the total acidity of the soil, not just what soil pH measures, which is the active acidity. What's happening right now, okay? There's, there's, there's active acidity and there is reserve acidity. You put those two things together and you get an estimate of the total acidity of that soil for its ability to resist a change, okay? So all soils uh, are gonna start, or all buffer indexes start at 6.6 .6 and go down from there. So as that number goes down, uh, that means that the, the soil is more resistant to change, and that means that it's going to recommend a higher amount of lime to enact that change. Uh, and I think that it comes into play cation exchange capacity, which also is an estimation of the, uh, the soil's ability to resist change. Uh, and that is typically, if you look at soils and classify them, uh, sandy soils are less resistant to change. They have less cations or, or, or cations on the soil particles that must be changed to have an influence on that soil with regard to pH or fertilizer. Whereas a soil that is high in clay, which is us, our soils, or a soil that is high in organic matter has got a higher number of cations on every soil particle, so it's more resistant to change. You have to change more things to get to that desired endpoint. All right. If a person doesn't know if they have cool or warm season grass in their lawn, uh, which code, the 202 or the 204 on the soil test forms, should they use? Or if they have a mix of cool and warm season grasses, which code should be used? I think what they, what you would need to ask the client is what is predominant. Okay, so if it is if it's predominantly cool season fescue except bluegrass, then I would use that code. If it's predominantly Bermuda grass or zoysia, and there's a little bit of cool season mixed in there, use that code. But at the end of the day, from a fertilizer standpoint, it's more of an issue of timing. Whether it's a cool season or a warm season lawn, it's as much an issue of what amount of fertilizer we do. It's more of a timing issue. We have primarily cool season. We want to be doing most of that fertilizing in the fall of the year to build that root system. If we have a uh, warm season grass lawn, then we, we're going to do more of our fertilizing in the spring and summer when you've got the most active growth of that, of that species. All right. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions, so I'm going to try and read through these. Um, let's see. Um, if, since 101010 fertilizer is usually readily available, uh, but the 211 fertilizer aren't often readily available, um, is there any reason to why they might see a 101010 more often than a 211 on the shelves? And are there any good places to buy the 211 fertilizers? Yeah, that is a good question. And, and the, the 10 10 10, I guess, is just ubiquitous. It's been around forever. You know, we used to use it a lot on lawns. You, you typically don't see it recommended on by the lab for lawns anymore. And that has to do primarily with the issue of, of phosphorus levels and, and potential for groundwater pollution. We don't want to be over applying phosphorus and when you use a 10-10-10 product or something like that, uh, remember that crops do not extract nutrients in a standard percentage. In other words, uh, a typical cool season grass is going to use more nitrogen and need more nitrogen than it does phosphorus and potassium. So if you apply equal amounts of all three nutrients over a long period of time, effectively what you are doing is over applying phosphorus and potassium, which can lead to, to a water pollution uh, situation, okay? So as far as where to find some of these different types of blends, uh, you're probably not going to readily find them at big box stores. You may need to move towards 
you know, maybe a farm co-op, you know, your southern states, your tractor supplies, your Augusta co-ops up in the valley. Uh, and, and, you know, the agents in your area may have a, a good idea of where you could find some of these other some of these other blends. All right, and since we are just after 11, I'm gonna go ahead and make, that was gonna be our, our last question for today. Again, as Scott mentioned, if you asked questions today and we didn't get the time to, to address them, or if you do have uh, additional questions, see your extension agent or other master gardeners in your area. Um, we have a lot who are working on the healthy Virginia lawns and work a lot with fertilizer recommendations and soil amendments. Um, this was recorded and so please look for that on our webinar archive um, within the next couple days, um, certainly within um, the next week. And I did post that link at the very beginning of the chat box. So if you scroll all the way up, it should be one of the first links um, up there. So thank you very much, Scott, for joining us. Hopefully everyone enjoyed and got a good refresher and is ready to get out in the garden. Thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure. All right. Thanks, folks. Take care.